And so I, I have lots of people your age say to me, well, you know, this is great, but you know, I'm 30 years from retirement. And I said, no, you're not. You're 30 years from the date, but you're not 30 years from thinking about it. In today's episode, Courtney and I have the pleasure of sitting down with Gary Surak. Gary is a 40-year veteran of the financial services industry and owner of Surak Financial Services, been in the industry for 40 plus years as a financial advisor, has a book called How to Retire and Not Die, which provides the tools you'll need for a happy and healthy retirement because it's just not about the money. It's about a fulfilled purposeful retirement because every day is Saturday. And that's exactly what we talk about in today's episode. Everything from how much is enough? What does a rich life look like? We, we cover the three P's. We talk about the importance of having a plan, not only a plan for going into retirement, but a plan during retirement and much, much more. So with that being said, let's start the show. Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. We are your hosts, Michael and Courtney Weaver. And today we have a very special guest, Gary Surak. Gary, how are you? Oh, we're doing really well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Gary. We we really appreciate it. And, and look, I'm pumped about, about this call. You're a retirement expert specialist, and I want to dive right in. So you wrote a book, how to retire and not die. Well, tell me about this. I mean, are people retiring and dying right away or what's going on? The answer is yes. Um, and it's really kind of bizarre. I've been in the financial service business for 42 years. And uh, and in that time frame, I just, you know, you learn a lot what you don't know. Well, guess what? I'm learning a lot I didn't know. And part of what I'm finding out is that if people don't figure this out, they check out pretty fast. And I saw it happen a long time ago. And then all of a sudden it became very apparent that I started losing friends and, and people I cared about and clients. And there was a there was a connector to, between all those people. And the connector was they were retiring from something, but not to something. And therefore, that's really why the title came in to be. Dive into that a little bit more. When you say, I mean, on average, so when somebody retires, on average, when are they when are they passing away? Well, it's all over the place. I mean, lots happen, but here's what I know. If people have something to do, they're way more passionate and they have they have a purpose. They have a reason to get up in the morning. They have something that really drives them and keeps them focused on life. And so what happens is that I, I see this going on all the time. And it's really critical that you have a, a, a plan, something that happens. So I ask one of my favorite questions is they come in with plenty of money. And I say, okay, the money's fine. We'll spend a few minutes on that. And we do. And because that's every that's the only thing they think is important. And then it's not the most important thing. It is important for about 10%. And then I say, okay, tell me about your first day, your first week, your first month, your first year of retirement. And then I shut up. And then I wait. And then they say, well, we're going to go to Italy for a year. I said, that's great. For a year, he said, oh, no, we're going to go for a month. I said, okay, that's more sensible, but tell me what you're doing. And then they say, well, we're going to go for a month. I said, wonderful. They tell me about their trip. I said, okay, you get back from Italy. Tell me about your first day, your first week, your first month of real retirement. And they don't know. And that's really, Michael, that's the problem. If you don't have some kind of a plan, you're out there in limbo and you've always been scheduled your whole life and now you have no schedule. And that becomes rather depressing, actually. It can be. So what do you say when they say, I don't know? What's the next step? Uh, then I say you should buy my book because <laughs> that book will tell you how very self-serving, by the way. Thank you for your question. No, very self-serving. I, I tell them you should, you need a plan and you need to figure this out and you need to spend some time thinking about what it is in your life that you want to do because all of a sudden you now have free time. You never had free time and you have seven days a week of free time, which by the way is a lot of free time. How are you going to spend it? What makes you happy? What's fun for you? So I kind of walk them through that whole exercise process and 
And I actually give them homework, uh, Courtney. They, they literally go home with homework and said, wow, this is work. And I said, well, what did you expect? You know, you worked your whole life and you think it's easy street? No, it isn't. Um, the cover of the book is a guy climbing a mountain and getting to the top and he's holding a flag and he's celebrating the fact that, oh, I've got to the mountain, I'm at retirement. But the reality of it is you get to the top of that mountain and you've worked your whole life to climb it, you get to the very top and then you realize, wait, I have 26 more years to go. I have a marathon to run and I don't even know how to train for that. I don't know what to do. So that's really how that mountain got into play. So if I put myself in that situation, what besides what brings me happiness, what brings me joy, what are what what other questions or what other ideas are you giving your customers ideas to think about? Because look, every day is a Saturday in retirement. And so that's a lot. You're right. That is a lot of free time. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, pickleball, fishing, travel, like, but you got you this know, down. We're, we're, already, some golf, we're but already preparing. What, what I mean, what, so what are you seeing like firsthand experience? You're working with customers through retirement. You've been doing this for 40 years. What are you seeing that brings those folks? Like I would say there's a commonality of joy or what people are doing in the retirement years to give them purpose, to, to feel fulfilled in what they're doing. Uh, great question. And, and the answer to that question is that work list, I, I, I like, I call it a wish list. It's a working list. But my wish list, I started when I was probably in my 40s. And, and it came to be because one day I was sitting in my office looking out the window daydreaming, which I got in a lot of trouble in school for that. Uh, and, and not so much at work. But anyhow, uh, I remember looking out the window thinking, if I wasn't working today, what would I be doing? And I found myself playing golf on a golf course that I always wanted to play. And then I thought about that and I said, well, that's interesting. So I wrote it down and I found that by the time I got really looking, I had 50 items on my list. You know, I want to go to Maui. I want to go to Charleston. And, and I just started writing things down. A lot of them were travel. A lot of them were golf. A lot of them were, my wife is a master gardener, so I was going to visit these really exotic gardens. We went to Holland and did a river cruise. She wanted to see the tulips, stuff like that. And, and some of it was nothing that was just other than going for a walk in the woods. And I thought, wow, this would be a beautiful fall day to go walk in the woods. Why am I sitting in this office? What would I do if I wasn't? Oh, I'd be walking in the woods. Those are the kind of things I start thinking about now there's i'm into coffee shops i like mochas so pretty much seven days a week and that's only because there's not eight i would have a mocha and i make my own and blend them and i have all these exotic chocolates and all kinds of stuff so a little quirky but fun and i go hit coffee shops and so there's three new coffee shops within driving distance we will go catch all three of those and then we'll mess around with that and figure out which one we like the most and it's just one of those things i like grocery stores so i will wander into grocery stores when we're traveling just to check out what their grocery store looks like it's a little weird but i'm comfortable with that i'm <laughs> always interested in how people set things up and what they do and how they display and for some kid, uh, for some reason, as a kid, I just like groceries. So I don't know. Those those are the kind of things I would write down, Michael. I think that's uh, incredibly fascinating because I'm even thinking about at our age, this is a practice that we do today. Like we did it last night. We're actually going to be spending some time. We're wintering in Sedona, Arizona. And last night we made our <laughs> list of what are we going to do while we're in Arizona? Just really carving out an intentional life. So I love that you're bringing this up in retirement because I feel like this applies to any stage, but there was a key thing that you said at the very beginning, and that is they have plenty of money. So I want to talk about how do they get to that spot where they sit down with you and they go, okay, I have plenty of money because that's the dream, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, it's a, Courtney, plenty of money is a relative term because plenty of money might be 50,000 to one person, 100,000 or a million to someone else. It, it just depends who they are, what they're used to and what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, I have a client of mine who has enough money to live in Florida in a trailer park 
and have a whole bunch of friends who finds the fact that I don't think she has a lot of money, but she thinks she's pretty rich because she's living a really rich life. In her mind, this is really cool and, and I'm all for her and I give her a hug because she's happy. So I think money is a relative term. It's what you're used to. You know, I have clients of mine that fly, fly around and fly, you know, they'll they'll do private jets and yachts and all that stuff. And I say, okay, you know, that's fine if that's what you're into. And it just what are you into? What do you want to do? Um, by the way, I love Sedona. So I think you're going to have fun. That's a really cool place. And it's, uh, we've been there about five, six times now. It's very yeah. great hiking. Yeah. 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 We, Sedona's our, our magical place. We've been there probably 10 times in the yeah. last five years. And so we decided just to pull the trigger, get out of this Kansas City winter weather in the months of January, February, March, go go enjoy Arizona. But you just brought up something, a rich life. And I think that that's really important. Courtney and I were just having this mm -hmm. conversation this weekend because we're both very motivated entrepreneurs. We want a lot out of life. And sometimes that causes like me personally anxiety or I don't have the patience to get what I want, but it's just, you got to stay in the game. But what you just said, everybody's goals, everybody's dream life is different. And as long as you're happy and your life is rich, like you just said, I think that that's extremely important. And that means that you have to have a really in-depth conversation with your customer around what is an ideal retirement to you, like, which is what you're hitting on. What's an ideal day? I mean, is it sitting in your place in Florida, just in lawn chairs, talking to friends every day? Or is it out traveling, flying in PJs and being on yachts a month or two months a year? Like, what is the dream life and how are you going to get there? And that's really, I'll give you a wonderful example. I had a doctor come in to see me, 72 years old, friend of mine, client of mine for many years, client of my father's who started our business in 1957. Um, so he, he was just a, a good guy and surgeon. And he sat in my office one day and said, Gary, I want to retire, but I don't know what to do. I said, well, let's talk about money. We talk about money and his advisor <laughs> he's not his advisor anymore, the guy he was using. And and the reason is because he wanted to give him 120000 a year income off of $3 million, 4%, and said, well, you'll never run out. And my friend said, you know, I make about two twenty a year, and I'm trying to figure out how to live 100000 less. And he said, I can't make the math work. And he said, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd look at this a little differently. I said, first of all, you can take 7%. And he said, I can. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, when I run out of money, I said, yes, eventually, but not before you die. I said, but that life insurance that you bought for me uh, will fill in the gap. And he looked at me and says, so I can get 210 a year? And I said, well, yeah, but you got to count your social security. Anyhow, we got up to about 250. And so we did that. And, and it took maybe 10 minutes for him to realize that he probably needed a different advisor. So anyhow, uh, different stories. So we sit there and I said, okay, his, his, we're talking and I said, tell me what you're going to do in retirement. He said, well, that's my biggest problem. I don't have any friends. He said, all I've ever done is operate on people. He said, I got a lot of patients, a lot of people that know me because I saved their life or whatever I did. He said, but I don't have a lot of friends. I don't even know what I want to do. Well, he and I play golf. And I said, well, why don't you play more golf? And so he joined the Geezers Golf League. So it's a bunch of older guys and they play golf together twice a week. They bowl together in the winter twice a week. They go to lunches, they go to ball games, they go to dinners. And he's got a new social life. He's got the best friends he's ever made. I actually, he's my golf league partner. And we're in the cart one night and, and he, it was a delay or something. He turned to me and says, Gary said, I have to tell you something very exciting that you told me would happen. I said, okay, what is it? And he said, I actually have friends. He said, I've never had friends. He said, I actually have people that care and call me up. And he said, I have like real relationships. And I said, yes. I said, do you know why? And he said, not really. And I said, well, because for the first time in your life, you're not tied to an operating room. You're tied. You now have a chance to really be who you are instead of who you were in that operating room. And he said, you know, he said, I really like not being doctor or whatever. And anyhow, very interesting. So I, I think people can transition to whatever they want to transition to. And sometimes they can do much better than they think because they just don't understand how money works, sometimes not quite so well. Um, so it's just figuring out who you are and what you want. 
and whether this is the right time to retire. I'm a huge fan of semi-retirement. I, I consider myself partially retired. I work five hours a day and I take a lot of vacation. Um, probably over two months this year, easy. And the reason for that is because I can and I've worked hard enough to do it. And also because, yeah, I want to, you know, I, I just want to be fresh for when I'm working and I want to get my breaks. I want to do my Sedonas. So uh, yeah. we're going to, we're going to Santa Fe, New Mexico in a couple of weeks. The same reason you're going to Sedona, you know, it's just a great place to hang out and, you know, kind of experience something you don't normally experience. We love Santa Fe. Yeah. Santa Fe is amazing. I mean, the food is amazing. Yeah, I've never had a bad meal in Santa Fe. The if, if you give me names and restaurants or things you guys like to do, that would be wonderful because we're going out there on a just kind of wing it. So if you have some direction, we're clueless. I know we're staying in a really nice hotel. Yeah. So that's the other thing. So I, I have lots of people your age say to me, well, you know, this is great, but you know, I'm 30 years from retirement. And I said, no, you're not. You're 30 years from the date, but you're not 30 years from thinking about it. So that wish list comes in really big. The other thing I recommend is for people to do a loves, likes, and hates list. And I outline that in the book. So the hates are everything you really hate doing, but you're doing it because you feel like you have to. Your likes are what you do, be, you enjoy them. <laughs> and then your loves are your loves. And, and I give this to owners to companies all the time. And I say, okay, you know, you, tell me what your likes, your loves, and your hates are. I said, write these things out. I give them a couple minutes and they write them out. And the hate list is about that long. The like list is about that long. And the loves are about that many. And so they come into me and say, well, I'm going to retire. And I say, great, what are you going to do? So I don't know. I'm really worried about that. I said, well, let me go back and ask you a key question. Tell me what was on your loves list. They said, well, I like sales. I like marketing. I like this. I said, so why aren't you going to continue to do that for your company? Why would you stop doing something you love? And, and the answer is they wouldn't if they really thought their way through it. So I get them to think their way through it and to really understand what's about to happen. And I probably have, oh God, 50 people who are going to totally retire who are semi-retired now and really happy. Now, maybe they work for a year, maybe two years. One guy went five years. One guy will go for the rest of his life because he's never been this happy. And they have, it's just found their way and, and just doing the stuff they really love doing and not all the stuff they really didn't care for. I think is a is when I was your age, I started thinking about those things. Um, I'll give you a great example. I do not own a lawnmower. There's a reason I've never owned a lawnmower, and there's a reason I will never own one. I don't like mowing grass. I mowed grass when I was a kid. I didn't care for it. I had to. I didn't have a choice. And as soon as I got to a point where I didn't have to do that anymore, I said, "We will never own a lawnmower, Linda, in our entire life, and we have never had one in our garage." It's sacred. There will never be one in that space. I'm not going to do that. I'll pay someone else to do the crap I don't want to do. Amen. I don't like to mow. Either. There is no lawnmower in the garage. I had to mow. <laughs> My kind of people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, yeah. it's just, I agree with you. Like you have to, it's kind of the rich dad, poor dad concept too, of just hiring out the things you don't like to do that just aggravate you. And um, yeah, I, I mowing's just not my thing either. I love that we're having this conversation because this is, we talk about this a lot about how we want to live like we're retired right now, because you do, I've noticed it. And a lot of people that get to retirement, they get to this spot where they, they do miss having a purpose and they do miss showing up and being needed. And they do miss the, busyness that comes with a job. But I want to segue a little bit and and talk about as a provider, because you've been in the financial services industry. Are there certain tools? Again, I'm stuck on money because money makes retirement more fun. Now, whatever enough is, is very different. But what can we do as 30-somethings to start making sure that we have I, I'm mid 30 you're upper 30 okay okay, okay. <laughs> well, uh, ooh, well, that was anyway. shots fired shots <laughs> fired <laughs> I know oh gosh yeah I, I, I'm a conversation a few times so yeah. to answer your question Courtney I, I am a huge fan 
I, I, I grew up saving money as a little kid. It, it was just built into my, my DNA. So I've always been a saver. I, I tell my clients if they're saving 10%, that's great. If they're saving 15, that's better. Where they save it, I think is important. I'm a very conservative uh, financial advisor. I tell people, if you're looking for Vegas, you're not finding them in Gary Sarak in Canton, Ohio. It isn't gonna happen. So you need to go to Vegas if you wanna roll the dice because that's not what I do. So I really like life insurance, but I'm very picky what I sell. I'm very picky what I own for myself. I like certain annuities that make a tremendous amount of sense. They're actually way better than they used to be. And some of them with no fees, if you get the right bells and whistles, actually are very effective for saving money. And, and those are things, and I'm a big fan of, of I don't like debt. Um, I am strong at eliminating debt. And I really like the idea where I pay cash for a lot of things because I don't want to have a big credit card bill that I can't pay. Not that that happens, but I just don't like those big bills. So I'm a cash guy and old fashioned, my wife said, but it works really well. And I also am a huge believer. I, I had a client of mine come to see me and they were a hundred grand in debt on credit cards. Uh, they were paying about 21,000 a year in interest, getting nothing. And they sat in the office and they said, we need to fix this. We've never fixed it. We've just never addressed it. We need help. And I said, well, the first thing is how many credit cards do you own? It turned out they own six cards. I said, I want you to cut up five. And the one you leave, I want you to make it a debit card, not a credit card. And they said, okay. I said, and then you keep one credit card for emergencies only. And I said, and we'll define emergencies. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to really think in terms that you each have a debit card and that's what your budget is for the month. If you go over that, you better have cash to pay for it. And if you don't, don't buy it. And what they did is they said, okay, and then we started talking about paying down debt and, and getting rid of cards. We eliminated three cards in a year. Now, they did not live uh, quite as high in a hog as they were living. They were eating out all the time. They stopped doing that. They found out that they actually could cook, that stove did work. They weren't sure. And she actually tried the oven and was stunned. It actually worked too. And so they started cooking at home a little bit. And the next thing you know, they came to see me a year later and it was amazing. They had shipped away about 25,000 of that debt, which I thought was really impressive. Within four years, that debt was completely gone. Uh, they now each have one credit card apiece. They live on cash mostly and they pay their card every month. And they haven't had a negative month since they started the program. Now, I, I just kind of thought about that one day and, and thought, what would I do if I was in that position? And that's what I came up with for myself. And I said, well, this is what I would do if it was me. Here's how, and let me know if it works. I'm really interested. So they were kind of like my guinea pigs, but that worked really well. Hard to do. Yeah, that's the trick. We love credit cards, but that's the trick. You have to pay those bad boys off every single month. But if you're really disciplined at it, it's free money. Like I encourage all business owners to definitely have credit cards. I, I love them. I want to dive back in though, just real fast to your investment approach, the life insurance and mm -hmm. the annuities. Um, so you prefer those over the stock market, for example, someone at our age, so mid thirties planning for retirement, or is there a good allocation mix or, Hey, stock market, early age, maybe some more conservative permanent life insurance annuities later on in life. What, what are, what are you, what do you recommend? What, what are you seeing? Well, you have to have stock market because you're way too young not to. And, and that that's just mandatory. That's a given. And anything, you know, if you have IRAs or simple plans or a 401ks, it, you're in the market and you need to be, and, and I consider that part of the 10 or 15%. Oh, 100% has to happen. Um, and, and not only that, you know, if you look at the numbers and statistics, it's going to back you up and you'll do fine. You're going to have your bad periods. We've had them we're going to have some more bad periods because that's the real world. You know, in my career, I've seen lots of ups and downs and uh, yeah, I've been on a roller coaster. But what happens is as long as you're faithful to the system and you keep playing the game, you're going to dollar cost average in when it's really ugly and you're going to not get so much when it's high. And 
In the real world, you know, you'll do fine. So you've got to have the stock market. Inside those annuities, um, definitely want the stock market, 100%. There's no question about that. The conservative money, the bond money is what I use for the life insurance. And the reason I like the life insurance approach is because it's tax deferred. Um, I like whole life policies. I like mutual companies. I'm a big fan of conservative. I like dividends. But the reason I like the life insurance is a number of things can happen. You can use that product as you build it up to do lots of things that can actually generate money for you. And I've, I've had so many clients that have used their cash values to take advantage of opportunities. And I mean, I had a client call me one day, borrowed 300,000 from his life insurance. He bought a condo in Naples right after the real estate crash in 08. And he bought this condo for 300 grand and he sold it, I think for 1.9 million. So I thought that's pretty good. So those are kind of things. Yeah, that was good math. I was always good in math, got good grades there. So when I think about that, that's because he had that cash laying in that life insurance that he could access without any hassles. He didn't need to go to the bank. He just needed to use that money and he used it properly. And quite frankly, there wasn't any way in the world that guy was going to take 300 and turn into 1.9. Certainly wasn't going to happen in the stock market or my life insurance policy but he was able to take advantage of a great opportunity because he had that cash there. So I like life insurance as kind of an emergency fund and it's just worked well for me. Does you that bring up? Yeah. You bring up real estate. Is that, and do you still consider that a good investment? I know, Oh wait, it's much different than it is now. 2023. Yeah. Wait a little while. It'll be a better <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now, I'm not so sure. I, you know, I'm no financial analyst, and, you know, I'm no wizard, but it, prices are very high. And I know what my father always said, what goes up must come down and what goes down must go up. Well, right now, real estate's up pretty high. It's going to come down and interest rates are certainly going up and that's going to drag prices down. So that inverse curve thing is about to happen and where rates go up and values drop. And so I think yeah, I, I like real estate a lot. Um, I have a client coming in today and he's got properties in his retirement that fund a very nice retirement, better than any 401k I would have ever had. And those rent checks come in every month. And yeah, we, we were talking about the other day. He said he thinks he's getting eight grand a month net from his real estate properties. And that doesn't count anything else he's got. And how many things can you do that with? Not that many. I love that. So I have to ask, because you're an advisor, you're talking to customers all the time. You're getting asked about cryptocurrencies. I would imagine the Bitcoin. So, what is uh, what are you telling your customers about crypto and, and Bitcoin? I, I'm I have stayed away from crypto. I, I decided that it was over my head and over my capability to understand. I spent a number of hours trying to really get my arms around it, and I've had some really smart people sit down with me and explain it to me. And when I was done. I walked away and said, yeah, I, I can't do this. I just couldn't feel comfortable to the point where it's it's not like selling a stock or a bond. I just couldn't get my arms around it and I can't do something. So I have a, real, a rule that I use. I will never sell something I don't own myself. <clears throat> and I own zero crypto. Nor that you, what you're saying is, or in, yeah, what, or invest in something you don't understand. I think that's a big one. Yeah, I, I just can't invest in something I can't understand. And when yeah. people speak a little too fast for me and it's a little too confusing, um, I, I stay away from them. The faster they talk, the the less interest that I have, and the more questions I ask and the bad answers I get. And pretty soon I say, okay, this is a good one to click off on. We're going to stop this call. So. I try and stay away from things that I just can't get my arms around and I can't get them around crypto. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so, yeah. Nope. I, I had a, a brilliant doctor just ask him, tell me why uh, his crypto investment was so good. He put a half a million dollars of his 401k into crypto. And I listened to him and he was telling me all the brilliant things he had done and all these things. I haven't talked to him for a few years, but I always wonder how he's doing now because the crypto world isn't what it was. And yeah, I'm curious if he's as arrogant as he was a few years ago telling me how brilliant he was. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a serious bear market right now. So anybody in crypto probably is a down, I would imagine. <laughs> At least I know I am. So um, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to talk about, before we wrap this up, um, the three Ps. All right. So I would love to know about the three Ps in retirement. Maybe you've already covered them. I have no idea. Not really. So the three Ps stand for purpose, passion, and a plan. So purpose is what you do for other people. So what I found is that if you had purpose and you were getting up in the morning and you had something you were doing to help someone out, that's purpose. And it could be, I, I have a truck driver who uh, stopped driving cross country and was bored to death. And he now delivers meals on wheels. So he gets up in the morning three days a week and he delivers meals on wheels to little old ladies who love him and hug him and he has conversations. and. And that's his purpose. So passion is what you do for yourself. And, and passion could be, you know, walking the, the rocks of Sedona. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, passion is whatever you're passionate about. And that is really critical. So if you got to have purpose, you got to have passion. The P, the last P stands for planning. And so you can have all the purpose and passion in the world, but if you haven't planned how you're going to use them, it's pretty worthless. You really need all three Ps to make this thing go. And here's what's interesting, Michael. My clients that have all three Ps live longer than my ones that don't. And it's just that simple. They have all three things hitting. And for some reason, that combo seems to give them a longer life and a better perspective on life than not having it. So that's observation of a lot of people. And I mean, we've had thousands of clients walk through this office over the years. Those three Ps haven't failed me yet. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I could go off on a tangent on this because I, this applies, yes, it applies in retirement, but these are principles that we can use right now. Yep. We don't have to wait for retirement to go ahead and start living with purpose, living with passion and having a plan for what our life looks like. So your book, How to Retire and Not Die, you're working on something fun. We were talking about this before. We're, you're creating a masterclass to go along with it. So I wrote the book with my son, Max, who lives in Keystone, Colorado, up in the mountains. And he graduated college from Indiana University and said, Dad, I'm going to go out in the mountains and hang out for the summer. That was 21 years ago. Anyway, so, you know, I guess his idea of summer and mine are different. But uh, we got together and wrote this book. And it's interesting. He's 42. I'm 72. So we have a 30 year gap between us. And the discussion on retirement was fascinating. He he literally audio taped 24 hours of conversation between him and myself. And then he took that, scripted it into the book, and then he sent me the book. I wrote it, rewrote it, and by the time we were done, we got the book you guys have. So the reality of it is that book has done really well. It's it's on Amazon and our services and all those places, and it's gone literally around the world in some bizarre way, Australia, the UK, Canada, New Zealand. It's uh, Spain, Italy, I don't know. It's just funny how that the world works. And what I find from people who contact me is that they wish there was a little bit more that they could get from us. And we decided that would be some sort of a master class that we would sit down, Max and I, and have a dialogue like we're having right now about the same topics. You know, we'll take each topic in the book and in the workbook and it'll be a PDF and they'll be able to really work through their retirement listening to us just chat back and forth and talk about my retirement and how I plan my world out. That's the other thing about the book. Everything in that book came right from me. So I took my own personal life and did something I said I would never do. I put it on paper and, and expressed it and exposed it pretty much to anyone who wants to read about me. They're going to know way more about me than I ever wanted anyone to know. But I couldn't come up with a better way to do this. And Courtney, I couldn't think my way through. How do I get this information out without giving them my world? So that's what they get in the book. Well, now they get to hear Max and I discuss all those things. And hopefully that will spur them on and get them past the point where they're stuck. Fantastic. That's great. So Gary, if someone wanted to follow you, connect with you, support you, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Uh, GarySorak.com. And, and I have a how to retire and not die website that they can jump on. And if they go to GaryStrack.com, they'll find me. And there's all kinds of stuff out there, I guess. 
I don't pay a whole lot of attention, but yeah, anyway, so people tell me we submit things, we put things out. One thing I do is I shoot a lot of pictures of places I go and, and I put that out on the website. I seem to get a lot of people that like that, uh, which is kind of fun. And I like doing it. It's kind of like we did one from the Lantern Festival up in Cleveland last weekend. So there's a picture of Linda and I and some kind of big Asian thing that I don't know what it was, but it was a good picture. So that's a way to follow us. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Gary, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you. And for all of those of you that are listening, thank you so much for your time and your support. As always, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all have. We appreciate you spending time with us today. Go out, make it great. Gary, thank you again. Oh, you guys are a pleasure to talk to. You're a whole lot of fun. And uh, and I think you guys are going to do really well in the game because you got the right attitude. So. Thank you. Thank you so much.